Hello, everybody. My name is Deborah De Bruin. I'm the interim director of the Center for Bioethics at the University of Minnesota. And I want to welcome you to the first ethics grand rounds of fall semester. We're going to do things uh, just a little bit differently today. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to take a little time to honor the memory of our friend and colleague, John Song. John was a core faculty member here at the Center for Bioethics. He also had a faculty appointment in the Department of Medicine. He had planned to be the lead researcher on the project that we'll be hearing about today, but unfortunately, he passed away just as the project was beginning. We're very much looking forward to hosting a discussion of the results of this project, not just because it's an important topic, but also because it gives us an opportunity to honor John's legacy. We had hoped to gather together in person to do this, but we decided we were not gonna let COVID-19 deter us from our plan. For those of you who don't know John, let me tell you just a little bit about him. His research and clinical practice reflected his strong commitment to justice and equity. His work focused primarily on the needs of people who are underserved and marginalized in our society. He worked at Healthcare for the Homeless in Baltimore, Maryland for five years during his training. He also convened the first US conference on homelessness and HIV AIDS through the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Federal Health Resources and Services Administration. As a faculty member here at the U, he conducted really groundbreaking research resulting in several publications that were among the first to characterize end of life care concerns among people facing homelessness, as well as the first randomized controlled trial of an advanced care planning intervention in homeless populations. He also founded and served as medical advisor for the Phillips Neighborhood Clinic in Minneapolis, a free clinic staffed by volunteers and students with a dual mission of serving those without insurance and fostering meaningful educational opportunities for health profession students. In addition, he served as faculty advisor for the Interprofessional Street Outreach Program, which provides healthcare at sites such as homeless shelters and food shelves in coordination with relevant community organizations. As I mentioned, John was starting to work on the needs of people who are incarcerated before he died. He earned many honors and awards during his career, but despite his considerable accomplishments, he was a very humble person. He was, however, always very generous about recognizing the accomplishments of his colleagues and students. Although he left us far too early, he nevertheless created an inspiring legacy of staunch advocacy for disadvantaged people and compassionate care for everyone. He was a wonderful teacher, a devoted mentor for his students, and a warm and wonderful colleague. We know that there are a lot of people who want to help us remember John and keep his legacy alive. So we have a short video presentation to share with you with remarks from some of his friends and colleagues. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this special occasion of honoring the memory of my dear friend, John Song. I worked with John on his advanced care directive project, tailoring advanced care directives to the needs and preferences of homeless populations. The stories that we heard and learned together about the wishes of homeless populations around the most vulnerable time that they can imagine. And John handled this in his usual way of being sensitive and gentle and caring and thorough. And uh, his heart is full of gold and a wonderful colleague. And I miss him a lot. I really miss him and I know we all do. And I just wanna send regards to his family and his children and his wife, and uh, we all miss him greatly. Thank you. John Song was a physician and scientist, but I knew him best as a friend and a person. 
When he was in the hospital for treatment and his sleep was repeatedly disrupted for measurements of his vitals, he doubted whether these well-meaning interventions were actually as vital to his well-being as the rest he knew he needed. This experience as a patient led him to wonder as a physician about how the healthcare system could be better designed to serve its patients' needs. As a person, when he would express what he expected to miss most about this life, it was decadent foods, sunset walks with his wife and seeing his daughters grow up. This led him to think as a scientist about how measurement often misses the unmeasurable goods that matter most, much as a healthcare system disproportionately ascribes importance to that which happens to be measurable. So the research challenge that he framed for us was this, how to measure scientifically what matters beyond measure. Much as his career, it seems to me, was devoted to underserved populations who were often not counted by a medical industrial complex, but who to him were human beings of unmeasurable value. Hi, I'm Dr. Edward Ratner. I met John shortly after he came to Minnesota. I recall his passion for some of the most medically underserved populations, such as those who are homeless. We immediately hit it off, and then John identified a way for us to work together, doing research on the end-of-life issues among the homeless. I brought expertise in advanced care planning. John understood homelessness and, of course, medical ethics, but also had extraordinary writing skills. We started small in 2001 with an intramural grant, but John thought much bigger and better eventually being awarded over $1 million from the NIH. Mostly, I want to remember John's numerous qualities. While being remarkably thoughtful, he went far beyond intellectual analysis of biomedical issues. He was insightful enough to create an interdisciplinary team. He was humble enough to seek out the input of community to define the research problem. He was collaborative enough to seek others' expertise to perform innovative, community-based, qualitative research. He was organized enough to complete a large-scale, randomized trial, completely off campus, both on time and under budget. He was generous enough to invite students to participate. John left the Center for Bioethics a legacy of high-quality, creative, and engaging federally funded bioethics research. Today's Grand Rounds is a testament to that legacy. I'll never forget the first time I met John. I asked him why he was so passionate about end-of-life care for people experiencing homelessness. And he told me the story of one of his patients when he was a doctor for healthcare for the homeless that had been tragically found dead outside. And the only thing in his wallet was John's business card. And he told me that this weighed so heavy on his heart, thinking about his patient um, and how lonely he must have been in his final days. And I knew right then um, that John's commitment to this work and to the research was for all the right reasons. And I know that everybody who knew John could see that kindness and compassion in his eyes. The last time I saw John, he told me to never forget him. We will always remember you, John. You will live on in me, in everyone who knew you, in your research, and in all of the patients that you cared for and loved. John Song was a colleague of mine for the entire time that he was at the Center for Bioethics at the University of Minnesota. He was one of a minority of bioethicists to focus on people who live in our field's blind spot. A great deal of bioethics focuses on the problems of those people who have care and who want to refuse it, rather than on those who face enormous social, mental, and physical barriers to getting into medical care in the first place. Much of it treats health disparities as a side problem rather than as the core personal experience. The concerns of bioethics radiates outward from the academic health centers, ICUs, and research programs. And as a result, the field is often caught uninformed 
about our socially approved and ignored institutions such as prisons, nursing homes, and dispossessed neighborhoods from which catastrophes incubate in silence before they emerge full blown, just as COVID did. John Song made the study of end of life care for persons in homeless shelters, the focus of his work, 600,000 persons are homeless in the United States. That's more than the number of people with Parkinson's disease. In times of good health, they face enormous barriers to health care. And as they become disabled in the arc towards death, their needs and their vulnerability increase. John cared about them. Read his papers about memorial services in homeless shelters, which comfort the living and the soon to die as the alternative of simple disappearance in which a person dies and is spoken of no more, only as a stranger takes the empty cot. Read his papers. You'll hear in them a humanity and a willingness to learn from those who are ignored, from those people who our field would see if it did not have them in our blind spot. We should all do as well as John. I wanna thank everybody who provided us with those videos and for our events coordinator, Kayleen Jacobson for um, uh, coordinating that effort and for putting that together. We, we all do miss John a lot. But we know that his work will continue to promote equity and compassionate care through the influence he had on scholars, clinicians, policymakers, and students. We at the center are trying to do our part to keep his legacy alive by committing to lift up work on health equity. So in addition to the teaching and research of a number of center faculty members, Last year, we organized our entire Ethics Grand Round series around health equity topics. The center faculty voted to do the same thing this year, to use this resource of Ethics Grand Rounds to shine a light on critical health equity issues like John did during his career. So let's start by talking about end of life concerns facing people who are incarcerated. A few housekeeping items to help us get through the um, presentation today. If you have questions for the speaker, please use the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of your screen. You can put questions into the Q&A at any time during the talk. You don't need to wait until the end. We'll monitor and address them after the talk. If you have techn technological issues, please use the chat function and our support staff will address that with those issues with you privately. Um, biomedical engineering students can email the center's main email address, which you see there on the slide to indicate that your attendance to get credit for today's talk. And I will say also students, health profession students who are interested in, get, in getting interprofessional education credit for this um, uh, event uh, can also email that address. I want to uh, take a minute to thank the, our, our co-sponsors, our partners um, in bringing this talk to you today. Uh, the Rabina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice here at the U, our School of Nursing, our program in Health Disparities Research and the Med School. Finally, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce to you our wonderful speakers for today and we're so very grateful to have them with us. Dr. Susan O'Connor Vaughn is professor in the School of Nursing and the director of graduate studies for the Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing. The focus of her teaching research and service is pain and palliative care. 
She has developed and taught palliative care courses with a focus on advanced care planning and spiritual care. Dr. O'Connor Vaughn is an American Association of Colleges of Nursing, City of Hope, End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, Train the Trainer, in pediatric and adult palliative care. In addition, she was a hospice volunteer for older adults for 16 years. Dr. Patricia Berry is formerly professor at Oregon Health and Science University, director of the OHSU Interprofessional Hartford Center of Gerontological Excellence, and associate professor at the University of Utah College of Nursing. She is presently adjunct professor at the University of Utah College of Nursing and a palliative care nurse practitioner with Livio Health. Dr. Barry's research is on palliative and end of life care with a focus on marginalized populations. She holds certification as an advanced practice palliative care nurse and as a gerontological nurse practitioner and is a fellow of the Palliative Care Nurses Association and the American Academy of Nursing. I wanna thank you both for being here with us today and I'm gonna turn it over to you at this point. My name is Pat Berry, and as you know, I um, am a partner in this research, and my role here today is to um, give you all a little background about how this whole project came to be, and, uh, and also then to set the stage for Susan to talk about the results of our study. Um, I, what, um, when I was at the University of Utah, I actually, um, with colleagues, did an, ethno did an ethnography of the Louisiana State Penitentiary hospice program um, in 2011, 2013. We were there nine or 10 times. Um, and we were really curious about um, why this program works. It's actually considered to be one of the model hospice programs in prison in the country. We got to know people well. We interviewed all their volunteers. Uh, we also did a very extensive medical record uh, audit. And, uh, and we also interviewed staff. Um, and during that time, and as we completed that, study, I got very curious about the role of advanced care planning, um, you know, in this population. Um, um, this research was done with a colleague of mine from Utah who has an extensive background in corrections, um, me, uh, you know, end of life palliative care, as well as a social work colleague who also has background in end of life care um, and, um, and grief and bereavement. And so I got very curious about that and asked, I asked around, you know, we didn't see any advanced care plans in records. We asked people how decisions were made and so on. And so, um, so as I was leaving the University of Utah and then, um, and then going to Oregon Health and Science University, I um, thought, you know what, this is something that I would love to pursue. My colleagues at Utah really went in a different different direction. And so, um, so I decided really, frankly, on a whim to, um, to attend an Honoring Choices Minnesota workshop. Um, my daughter lives here. We actually ended up relocating here to Minneapolis for a, for a grandchild about four years ago. And, um, and as I went to that meeting um, and talked to people, um, probably um, five or 10 people said to me, you need to meet John Song, you need to meet John Song. And so um, soon after that, um, we were here for, uh, for a Christmas, uh, for the holiday celebration. And he and I met at the Starbucks on Lindale, very near to his house. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, when I was reflect on, um, on that meeting um, and, um, and also the comments that many of you have had already today, uh, we became um, fast friends and colleagues. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not unusual with John, as you well know. Um, very, very curious, very affirming 
um, about this was really interested because this really intersected um, with his interest in homeless populations as well. So we decided we would try to get into a little bit of trouble together. Uh, and and then, um, then we decided to start big. Um, uh, um, and assembled a group of colleagues from Penn State University, Susan Loeb, who does a lot of a lot of research in this area, a colleague of mine, um, and Chris Hollenbeek, who is a health economist. Uh, we actually um, found a grant mechanism. We're all set and ready to go. I had an AIMS page, uh, and um, and actually talked to uh, talked to a couple of program officers about that, and then. Um, and then, then as then as then as things happened, when John became ill, we decided to pull back a little bit and to regroup. Um, also, understanding that if we were to ever move this um, this work forward, that we would have to do some preliminary work, focus group work, on uh, on um, adapting my directive. Um, that was. Uh, um, that was created with colleagues in his homeless study for the um, for use in prison. Um, I began building relationships in Oregon, um, and then um, and then uh, we found um, um, the Hillman Grant mechanism, um, and we also wondered, you know, together and. Um, um, by then, Rebecca Schlafler from from um, also from the medical school had joined us, and we really wondered, perhaps naively or assumed, perhaps naively, but always being positive that maybe there was somebody in the country that knew how to do this or did this well. Um, and uh, so, so, and that's when we um, decided to really look at. Uh, um, um, also doing a national survey, which you'll hear the results of today. Um, anyway, and so, um, so, so as all of you know about John, I mean, I had never met him before, met him probably early in, uh, or um, around the holiday season in um, 2013, 2014. Um, and uh, the one thing I remember about John is how generous he was and frankly, how he made um, me, not that I really needed this necessarily, but he made me feel smart. And he made me feel like, oh, this is, this is such a great idea anyway. Um, and so, 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 then, um, so then as the Hillman Foundation grant um, got invited to full proposal and when it got, um, um, it got funded. Uh, we decided to focus in on um, using uh, using great colleagues from the University of Minnesota, and Susan's going to talk about that um, 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 that in just a minute. So the next um, uh, the next are the two actually um, objectives from our Hillman grant. Um, there we go. Uh, and actually, uh, Ahmed had um, two objectives. And what you'll hear from today, uh, from us today, is actually actually the results of the second, um, second objective, and that is a national survey. Once again, really hoping and assuming that there had to have been a state that really got this or that somebody was doing this right. Um, and, um, but, and, um, and the work of objective one was tabled for lots of reasons, the pandemic uh, being probably the most important reason, and also some of the security concerns that happen at um, here, um, uh, here in the state of Minnesota with, um, with um, some of our prison populations. So I, um, and you know, we hope that, um, that colleagues, um, that, that Susan Loeb, uh, I'm and her colleagues at Penn State, um, Bree Williams and her colleagues at UCSF um, may be able to continue and to work on um, um, to work on the first objective. But I think, um, but I, as I reflect on this, um, this this work, um, uh, this work and this commitment to social justice, um, serving and uh, and and um, you know, you valuing. Uh, valuing marginalized 
population, those populations that are in our blind spot, frankly, uh, really lives on, I think, through this study and through, through all the people that we've touched. Um, I just a personal note, um, John, you know, and I didn't know each other for very long. Uh, I, it was an incredible privilege to work alongside him as well as the other people on our team. Um, John is the voice in my head that tells me to keep going, to never give up. Um, and uh, there are so many things I wish I could talk with him about and I can't. So um, anyway, thank you for asking us to come. And, uh, and I will turn the rest of the time over to Susan, the PI of this project. Thanks. Thank you, Pat, and welcome to everyone that's joining today. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here to talk about our friend, Dr. John Song. I do have my Kleenex nearby, but I'm gonna be strong and get through this, I promise. The AIM-2 of the Hillman Foundation grant that um, Pat spoke of um, was titled, in terms of our paper, Advanced Care Planning for People in Prison, a National Survey of State Correctional Health Care Providers. But I will tell you that was fondly known as the Song Study. We always called it the Song Study. Uh, no matter what it was officially titled, it was the Song Study and kept us going. I do want to very uh, much in the beginning here really honor our wonderful interprofessional team. I know John was really passionate about having the interprofessional team and I was so blessed to be a part of it. Sarah Kettering was our trusty, amazing research assistant. She was a graduate student at the time. She completed her master's in public health last December and she kept us all organized, especially me and on track. And we just are so grateful to her. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Schleifer, as, as Pat mentioned, is here in um, our Department of Pediatrics. She's assistant professor and really an amazing expert in the area of corrections. And she was our go-to and our support and our wisdom throughout this uh, survey and the, the entire project. Um, as many of you know that know me, uh, I, my background's not in corrections, it's in palliative care. So we just really appreciated having Dr. Schlafer as our expert. Next, uh, Paul Galshu, Master's in Public Health, MDiv, and Board Certified Chaplain. Paul was our rock through this. Um, he's an amazing chaplain. We're so just very grateful to have him here at M Health Fairview. He is a research chaplain, one of the few in, in the US and probably around the world with an incredible background in being able to conduct focus groups. And he, he was gonna be our focus group facilitator. He's also a research fellow in transforming chaplaincy. So Paul, thank you. He, he always kept us grounded. We also had an expert biostatistician, uh, Rebecca Fries, um, who really helped us make sense of the data and uh, kept us organized in terms of looking at the data. What does it mean? What else could we look at in terms of investigating the, the, lot, the large number of uh, statistics that we had? And last but not least, Allie is a current uh, undergraduate uh, student here in the College of Liberal Arts. She will graduate next May, 2022, with a BA in sociology and minors in political science and public health. And Allie, we so appreciate you. You brought just such youth and wisdom and great questions to this project that I would never have thought of and really helped organize uh, the narrative data. So Allie, thank you, thank you. As you can see, we had an incredible interprofessional team. And we often through this project, especially during the pandemic would ask, what would John do? Uh, we should have had bracelets made, uh, but uh, he, he was our guiding light. So acknowledgements again, we could not have done this without the wonderful support through the Rita and Alex Hillman Emergent Innovations 
serious illness and end of life program. Again, the content that I'm gonna be talking about solely the responsibility of us, the team, the research team, and not necessarily represent the official views of the Hillman Foundation, but we are so incredibly grateful to the Hillman Foundation. They do such incredible work around the world and we so appreciate them. And then our dedication, of course, is to the memory of our dear friend, uh, Dr. John Song. His passion for commitment to social justice and health equity is interwoven in this work and served as an inspiration for the research team daily. And I will just say a side note about how I first met uh, Dr. Song. It was a few years after he arrived and I heard him speak in the academic health center. And I was so inspired by the work that he, he did with underserved populations. Um, my very first job as a, a new nurse many years ago was in the heart of Appalachia in one of the poorest counties in our country. And so I really could feel that passion that he had for those persons who were homeless. Many of the people I worked with in Appalachia were, were homeless and certainly underserved and really had issues related to health equity. I will tell you then once I heard him, I asked him to please speak to our nursing students. At that time, I was teaching senior nursing students the ethics course that they were required to take. And I would ask John to please come and talk about the underserved populations and especially end of life issues. And he would always do that. And I, I would, you know, always have a CV and try to summarize his CV when I introduced him. And he was such a humble man. When he would come up to the podium, he would say, oh my gosh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Even my own mother would not have given such a glowing review of me. So a great sense of humor uh, on uh, a topic that could be really challenging. I do think about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of current nurses who were inspired by him and doing this work because of him. And many went on to volunteer at the Phillips Neighborhood Clinic, uh, which was really, really great. The last little side note I'll say about John is quite a few years ago, I was at a nursing conference in, in Baltimore. And sitting there at this conference, there were some nurses from Baltimore and they said, University of Minnesota, do you know John Song? And what a, what a blessing for me to say, yes, I do. So uh, his legacy was certainly living on in Baltimore. So just some background about this national uh, survey that we did conduct. And I do want to uh, mention full disclosure, these data that I'm going to uh, discuss with you, share with you are pre-pandemic. And we have often wondered what would this have looked like during the pandemic? Would we have been able to even conduct the survey? We certainly were not able to conduct the focus groups even though we had them completely planned, ready to go, the first week of April, 2020, you know what happened two weeks before that. So they were put on hold indefinitely. But um, anyway, so just some background again, um, that it was really important for us when we were really researching this area. And I will say to any students uh, listening at this session, you're not going to be tested at all. Uh, and you don't have to write a paper, just submit to me. I have plenty of papers to grade. So what I did was I took my slide deck of 40 some slides and I condensed it down to about 25 so that we would have more time to talk about Dr. Song's legacy and see what questions that you have. So what I did was just pull out some talking points from, from these data. And um, so I uh, hope you enjoy what we have to share. So just as some background, there are about 1.2 million people living in over 1,800 state prisons in the United States. And to be clear, our survey focused on state prisons and not federal prisons and not jails. So again, state prisons. We know there's a lot of great information about those persons living in prisons. And we know that there are four times the number of persons in prison age 55 and older than in the US in 1993. And why is that? Well, multiple factors, but most important uh, that you see in the literature 
was that uh, the increase in long-term sentencing heavily used in the 1990s, war on crime, war on drugs, that kind of approach. And so those, those, those persons received much longer term sentencing and stayed, stayed in prison for a long time. Um, you'll see, I do have a reference here about Prison Policy Initiative 2020. Any of the references that you would like, I did not add my multiple slides of references, please contact me. I'll get all the references to you if you would like. What do we know about older adults living in prisons? Well, they're among the most powerless, marginalized and vulnerable citizens in the United States. They have a much higher prevalence of chronic and comorbid illnesses, such as higher incidence of hypertension, asthma, cancer, and hepatitis than the general population. They have a much higher prevalence of cognitive impairment along with dementia in this population compared to the general population of the US. So again, looking at this aging population in prisons with a higher prevalence of these chronic conditions and a higher prevalence of cognitive impairment. Adding to this patient uh, population's vulnerability of physical and psychosocial mental issues and ability to achieve death with dignity is that they may be estranged from their family or friends. They may be long disconnected from anyone who might serve as a support person through their chronic illness, through their health challenges, through their cognitive challenges. So again, without having that family or friends, there would not be that support person. So being unrepresented and without advanced care planning, this leads to care that's not wanted. Possibly they do not want the, the type of aggressive care that is, is offered, or they may not be receiving adequate care that, they, care that they actually deserve. So again, without representation, without having a healthcare proxy, without having an agent uh, to support them, they may be receiving care that's not even wanted or not receiving really holistic, adequate care. The other really interesting thing when you look at the data around uh, financial uh, issues with prisons is the cost of care for older adults in prison is three times the amount of their younger counterparts. So in the studies that looked at uh, the younger populations, the cost of their care in that prison system, and then looking at the cost of care for the older prisoners, the cost is three times greater. So our research goal really within this um, national survey of prison healthcare providers was to describe the state prison's practices and policies for persons in prison with chronic and life-limiting illnesses through a national web-based survey. What was our method? Well, we recruited from the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare through their uh, database. And um, um, our survey, which I'll talk a little bit more about, we use that survey. Our first email went out uh, with an invitation to over 3,941 addresses through this national commission. Uh, so almost 4,000 addresses. We sent a few weeks later a second invite because there are quite a few that were, you know, not the correct address, you know, no longer had this address, there were issues related to the address. But with the second invite, we had almost a 94% delivery rate to a, an address. And we had in total then about a 23% response rate. And the final sample size was a, over 1,055 completed surveys, and that's completed surveys. And again, when I look at that response rate, I think about what if we had conducted this during the pandemic, which you know would have been a big if, 
but what would have our response rate been? So we were pleased with that rate. Another, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the measure, we used an online survey. It was uh, in our, our interprofessional team um, developed the survey, tested the survey, piloted the survey. It was 40 multiple choice and open-ended items. The completion time did not really take too long, 10 to 15 minutes. And so even though there were 40 questions, they were pretty easy to answer pretty quickly. The questions in general focused on policies regarding advanced care planning within their, their um, prison, decision-making within their prison, especially around end-of-life care. Uh, what was their policy on compassionate release? and a variety of other uh, items that we'll talk about. We also asked for their participant demographics. Please tell us about you and about your professional experience and tell us about your facility. We'd like to know more. So jumping to the results, some of the really interesting participant uh, characteristics. Again, these are the people that completed the survey. Average age was 52 years old, again, for the participant completing the survey, with a range of 29 all the way up to 73. 71% of the participants who completed the survey identified as female, 82% identified as white, 53% worked in corrections eight to 20 years, and we kind of collapsed a couple of those uh, year uh, spans, but well, over half had been there, at least eight, all the way up to 20 years. And 46% were registered nurses. So again, when we look at the participants who completed the survey, almost half were registered nurses uh, within the, this state prison systems. Some of the really interesting facility characteristics 80% of the participants were working at all male prisons. So these were prisons that were totally, uh, completely male for male, for men. The average size in terms of the prison population was 3,577. So that was average for the respondents who, who uh, completed the survey. 40% of the participants were at maximum security. And on average, which is interesting looking at some of the things specific to uh, the facility and their policy, on average, three people were released for compassionate release per year. Now that's an average, three people were released. And think about the average prison population size of these um, prisons. On average, four people were transferred outside the prison within days or weeks uh, uh, to live. So on average, four people were transferred outside uh, to another facility or home or somewhere else. Some of the results related to the health care questions, 62 percent reported no end of life program whatsoever within their prison system. Again, 62%, so two thirds reported they did not have a hospice program. 71% did modify visitation for those who have weeks to months to live. So that is being a little bit more flexible with visitation for those uh, prisoners who only had weeks to months to live. An increased number, 78% modified visitation for those persons in prison with days to weeks to live, so a higher percent. And then 85% stated that they provided prisoners, uh, uh, persons in prison, the opportunity to complete a healthcare directive now, exactly when they completed the health care directive is uh, still, you kind of question that, but 85% of the participants said, yes, we do provide our uh, persons in prison the opportunity to complete one of our health care directives. So related to that health care directive, 
let's look at decision making. The participants uh, re reported 64% uh, were physicians most often responsible for facilitating the completion of the healthcare directive. So again, a large percent there, when you look at 64% stated, oh, it's up to our physicians to facilitate this completion of the healthcare directive, followed by, in terms of the percents, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and registered nurses. So again, mostly physicians were responsible. When was it completed? Most healthcare directives were completed with a diagnosis of a chronic condition. That's when they uh, chose to have those completed. 63% reported the individual can designate a healthcare agent. Now, if that was actually done, we don't know, but they reported that the individuals could designate a healthcare agent. And of interest, 11% reported that peers may be the healthcare agent, that is fellow prisoners. So only 11% reported that they allowed fellow prisoners, their peers within that prison could be the agent for that person. So just, there's a lot that we could discuss and we certainly in our papers had discussed a lot, but just some of the talking points and looking again back and redirecting our goal was really to describe state prisons practices and policies addressing the care of persons in prison with chronic life limiting conditions. Our results revealed that some prisons do utilize advanced care planning. However, only a small sample indicated that all prisoners upon admission are offered to complete a healthcare directive. Again, they reported that it was when the, the person had a, a serious condition, a chronic condition, that's when they would start the healthcare directive and not upon admission uh, to the prison. We really uh, have thought a lot about to ensure health equity for this population. Uh, our team really talked a lot about suggesting a national model policy to assure all people in prisons, number one, access to advanced care planning on admission. And really no matter the age, uh, but to have that ability uh, to plan especially with those with chronic conditions, but also to have ac access to advanced care planning when health issues change, when certainly diagnosed with a life-limiting condition. And while they still have decisional capacity, is that is a major concern uh, for not only the prison population, but for all in, uh, in terms of advanced care planning is that we want to complete these uh, plans, these directives, when the person has decisional capacity. The other thing we talked a lot about is that with, you know, to ensure health equity is that we would hope there's access to end of life care programs within all prisons. And I know there's just some great uh, research being done looking at this and certainly I can't imagine during the time of COVID what that must look like. The other thing in terms of end of life care programs there was some great innovative research uh, that was being conducted pre-pandemic. I don't know if that's been on hold now, but specially educated peer companions, that is their fellow peers in the prison, and specially educated hospice volunteers, those people who would like to come in and work with this population and to receive that specialized training um, to help care and give dignity uh, at end of life for, for these people. And then continued education is desperately needed for those to facilitate the advanced care planning process and completion of a healthcare directive. We certainly know physicians and nurse practitioners and physician assistants and registered nurses within the systems 
are uh, really the key in helping them complete this healthcare director. What other continued education can we give others who may be able to facilitate? And for those who are facilitating, what other education might they need? So uh, more research is needed in these areas. And I could have repeated that uh, on every slide. More research is needed in these areas and for this very special vulnerable uh, patient population. In conclusion, uh, we know that the US prison population is aging. It's putting a heavy burden on staff, providing care in state prisons. We know the current prison healthcare infrastructure wasn't designed at all for those who develop chronic conditions and need end of life care. So, you know, the, the resources are desperately needed to support this aging population and to support those healthcare professionals who are caring for them and really providing dignity at end of life. We propose then that continued dialogue and continued action regarding the national consensus on number one, care of older and chronically ill persons in prison, really looking more at the use of compassionate release looking more at what can we do for advanced care planning. And we do know that the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare has standards on uh, advanced directives. And what else can we do to help facilitate uh, that planning and those policies within all state prisons? And then we need continued dialogue and action for really holistic, compassionate, end of life care that Dr. John Song would want us to be passionate about and to provide. Again, I mentioned references. My many references, our many references are available for this presentation upon request. Please contact me. I'll get any of this information to you, but I wanted to be really sensitive to our time together and, um, and be able to spend more time in discussion. And I'll move uh, to the questions right here. So thank you. Tried to end on time. <laughs> so um, we're going to move into the discussion portion now. And let me just remind folks, um, use the Q&A function if you want to ask a question. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll work through those questions uh, as they uh, come in. I see that there are some questions in the Q&A already. Uh, there will be uh, an evaluation uh, that you will be uh, given that we'd ask you to fill out to help us um, uh, sort of understand um, your experience here and your suggestions about uh, uh, further Grand Rounds topics. Uh, it'll pop up in your web browser as the event ends, but you'll also get a link in, a po in, an, in, an, in an email that we'll send out after the event. And we would really ask you to take a few minutes to fill that out because we take them very seriously. Uh, again, uh, biomedical engineering students and folks who are interested in getting um, uh, credit for health profession students who are interested in getting credit for interprofessional education, uh, there's a link in the chat, but you can also email the center's main email address, which you see there on the slide, to get information um, about what you need to do to get credit. Um, and uh, this uh, 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 presentation is being recorded. So uh, that'll be posted uh, as soon as possible after the um, presentation is over, um, once we have a chance to uh, see to that. So uh, with all that said, we'll move to the um, Q&A. Um, and uh, one question here is about whether you've approached the US Department of Justice to see if there were existing programs that uh, might be federally funded. Uh, I'd, uh, I think um, uh, I'm guessing that the questioner means existing programs around end of life care in prisons. I know that you were really focusing on not federal prisons, but state prisons. Um, but do you have any information about uh, what happens at the federal level? I know we focused on state, but uh, uh, Dr. Barry, could you uh, add comment? Thank you. 
We decided to only focus on state prison because of how advanced care planning and advanced directive is uh, is actually um, um, off, you know, is actually under each state. Um, federal prisons are also subject to different sets of standards. Uh, federal prison infirmaries are surveyed and accredited by the Joint Commission, um, whereas state prisons, um, uh, you know, um, are not. Uh, and we had hoped um, to do these focus groups locally. We'd hoped to do these focus groups in Minnesota. And so we really looked at uh, only state prisons. We also decided not to look at jails um, because jails have a whole different population. Um, good, good, good question. Maybe as um, as we continued our our uh, quest into finding something that works, um, and um, um, that would be an interesting next step as well. So great question. Thank you. Next question is about whether it's common or uncommon for state prisons to have chaplains. Uh, and were the chaplains responsive? Did you, did you hear from chaplains? Uh, the questioner wonders if they would be a good source for encouraging and enabling advanced care planning within prisons. I think they'd be fantastic. Um, but, um, you know, majority of our respondents were physicians, nurse practitioners, um, physician assistants, registered nurses, who actually completed the survey. So, um, you know, the big question is, you know, whether or not they did have chaplains is a, a good question. And it'd be fantastic if they all had chaplains. Mm -hmm. I think that it really depends, you know, on the state and on the facility. Um, my main, um, my main uh, experience with prisons is in Oregon and in Louisiana. Um, I know that Louisiana, um, um, the Louisiana, the Louisiana State Penitentiary, they actually have a seminary that is on site, uh, and there are several chaplains that actually work through, um, they actually become credentialed and then work. Um, uh, um, they are fenders uh, too, um, and uh, but um, uh, but but I think that the chaplain's role in helping people think about um, think about preferences and so on is is critical. Uh, we had really hoped to, and I think um, think um, hopefully we made this clear. But we really you wanted to look at not not advanced care planning as um, at end of life, but really upstreaming it so that when people get um, more ill or perhaps even get diagnosed with a with a life limiting illness, that um, that advanced care plan can actually um, can be uh, and that um, advanced directive can be um, can be reviewed and modified. Um, there. Um, and we had actually hoped in our first objective with our focus groups is to figure out the best way to implement um, uh, how people could, um, could actually complete advanced, um, advanced directives and have an advanced care plan discussion. So uh, to be determined, I guess. <laughs> so the next question asks about, um, um, prisoners on death row in some states. So uh, not here because we don't execute prisoners in the state of Minnesota, but um, in, in some states, do you, did you get any sense from the data about um, whether there are differences uh, in advanced care planning for prisoners on death row? I don't remember that in the data at all. And I reviewed the data just recently and I don't remember any comments. Um, Pat, do you remember any comments about death row? I don't. Uh, no, I don't. And I, I don't think we asked about that. Um, no. um, actually specifically, um, um, because at the time we did the survey of memory serves me, uh, we were not as interested in that, um, you know? Um, and uh, so, you know, so when you think about, about the whole, 
a reason why somebody does an advanced care plan, you know, the whole choice and control and you know, things like that. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It's a really, really interesting question. Gosh, I wish we would have asked that. Um, hindsight's always 2020 with this stuff, isn't it? It is. Well, there's there's always the possibility for follow-up research. Absolutely, there is. You bet. It's one of the beautiful things about getting feedback when you do presentations is you know, mm -hmm. having it crystallize further questions. You bet. Yeah. yeah. That would have been um, an interesting um, question for us to ask. In Louisiana, they have a very large death row, very um, a sizable death row, but um, but the people that were in the hospice program, none of them were on death row. Um, and maybe it was the nature of people's illnesses and all of that. Um, so uh, the next question asks about whether there are ways to get involved in helping to increase access to end of life planning and dying with dignity in, in prisons at this point. Um, it, it, is there something that, that members of our audience could do? That's a, that's a great question. Um, given the pandemic, uh, uh, I think that most, um, you know, volunteer kind of um, opportunities are on hold right now in terms of the actual prison itself. However, I do know of other hospice volunteers pre-pandemic who did go to the prison sites, did go to jails. Um, and uh, again, that's a specialized training that they had, but um, right now, I have a feeling, and again, I don't know for sure that some of that open volunteer visitation has been put on hold because of the pandemic, uh, just the safety. And, you know, that was the reason why we had to put, one of the reasons we had to put our focus groups on hold was, you know, when the state shut down two weeks in, before our focus groups, you know, we were just really concerned, obviously, about the participants in the focus group and about our research team, their safety and well-being. But never, ever, ever the first week of April of 2020, imagining uh, that the pandemic would go on this long. You know, we just thought, oh yes, we'll get these focus groups done. We had the venue, we had our expert focus group facilitator, Paul Gaushu, we had our uh, food, we had, we had our uh, tokens of appreciation. We were set and ready to go. And um, very sadly, it all had to go on hold. Um, we would have gained so much information from, from those participants. Yeah. Uh, um, I do know that Honoring Choices Minnesota has done a fair amount of work. Um, at the um, at the maximum security prison yes. that's in Stillwater, you know there's you know the other one is right next door to it, um, and um, and they actually, uh, and that's how I uh, that's how I originally got um, got um, hooked up with John. It, it um, is that those people said, oh, you have to meet him uh, because this work is so similar, uh, and so. There are ways, I think, for us to work through Honoring Choices Minnesota. Um, most states do have an effort like that. I know Iowa does. Uh, and uh, and um, there is some work in Iowa with the, um, with the, um, with the POST form as well. Um, every, you know, every state is obviously different in terms of how they're, you know, you know, you know how they're organized, the hierarchy, um, certainly the prison system, uh, you know, each state is different. And then there is a warden at each, um, you know, prison site who basically calls all the shots, um, yes. you know, yes. you know, so to speak. Um, yeah. So I, I think that uh, for those of us that are in Minnesota, honoring choices is a really good way to get involved in, in another states to look up whoever is involved with, with, you know, that state's advanced care planning efforts as well. That's a gr great idea. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I wonder if I wonder if there are, um, you know, outside of those sorts of volunteer opportunities, I wonder if there are, um, um, you know, opportunities for advocacy work um, that, you know, wouldn't necessarily require volunteering in prisons, but that could involve, um, you know, advocating for, you um, 
um, you know, better practices around mm -hmm. end of life planning um, in, in, in prisons. Do you have any suggestions or ideas about that as an, as an option? You know, I was thinking about the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare and their website. They have a lot of information there. Um, that was an excellent resource for us. And so I think, you know, that would be a great place to start to look at that particular um, commission might be a great place. And they have a, a really great journal that I learned so much about corrections through that journal. And um, that might be a good place to start. Pat, did you wanna add anything there? I would agree with that. I also think that um, that um, you know, you know, having visited the um, the prison in Stillwater in terms of um, their relationship with hospice versus uh, versus how the hospice um, hospice in Louisiana um, is actually set up and run. Um, that 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 to. Um, that to ask to visit, to ask to tour, to to um, to ask to you know you know um, ask questions, uh, you know um, um, maybe being involved at the Minnesota DOC level. Um, and I don't know if Rebecca is on you know is in this seminar, but she's done similar advocacy work with with childbearing women and women who deliver in prison. Um, and um, she might be a really good person to come and talk about her work and how that how that kind of research really changed practices, as I understand it. Um, we, you know, you know, fortunately, we weren't able to complete this. We had really hoped long term to um, to work with the National Commission for Correctional Health Care. Um, propose some some you know like like a best practice guideline um, based on this but but unfortunately that was not meant to be right now and I see in the chat that our research assistant Sarah oh good <laughs> thank you Sarah for reminding me about the prison policy initiative which was actually on one of my first slides and then I just spaced oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you, oh, Sarah. Thank you. Our research assistant comes through again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she's, you know, she's not, she's not even on the team. Our team is just, you know, uh, still together in, in body. And um, so thank you, Sarah. Again, the Prison Policy Initiative. Um, and uh, you can go to their website. So thank you to Sarah Kettering. Thank you. So if you, uh, 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 I know that um, not everyone may be able to see the chat, the, um, uh, the Prison Policy Initiative, you can Google that obviously, yes. but their website is just prisonpolicy.org. Um, and if you look at backslash health, prisonpolicy.org backslash health, it should take you to some information about these things at the Prison Policy Initiative. There's another um, question in the Q&A that wonders about, um, about uh, you know whether there are virtual opportunities for um, volunteering, given that uh, you know in the pandemic in COVID we're unlikely to be able to volunteer uh, face to face, and um, you know it may be that um, you know connecting up with some of the resources that you've already mentioned would help folks to know whether there are you know. Uh, virtual opportunities for for volunteering. Does that seem right? That seems right. Yes, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question asks, and I think you may have already addressed this to some extent, but if you have further um, thoughts about this, whether there are established <laughs> relationships with Minnesota hospice organizations in Minnesota state prisons. There used to be, as I understand, the Stillwater Prison, I think, contracted with a hospice program um, and which actually sent in volunteers and staff. Um, going back to my experience um, 
Spencer, Louisiana, their hospice program was basically in-house. Uh, all of their all of their volunteers were actually specially trained, um, um, you know, people that were in prison, uh, and um, and their and their medical and nursing staff um, had some background in pain and symptom management. Um, we were actually really impressed by how well they did. And I think that and how and how their symptom control was really pretty impressive um, um, when we looked at records. Uh, so the issue always, of course, is security um, and um, you know assuring that uh, that people are safe and that the people that are already in prison um, security is almost always number one um, and. Once again, the pandemic has probably changed all that. Um, I don't know if Susan, um, uh, because you're on the board of the Minnesota Network of Hospice and Palliative uh, Care, whether you know of any um, members that are um, uh, on that organization that are also no. from prison. Um, no, no. And I, I do remember Stillwater had uh, an outside agency, right? That came they in? did. Yeah, they yes. did. Yes. Yeah, they yes. did. And I mean, there are multiple models all over the country. Um, right. And it seems like the, just right. from my limited experience, it seems like the one that was most effective was this um, time honored, um, you know, you know, um, um, program at Angola, frankly, and, uh, and how the volunteers were really very, um, you know, very concerned about it continuing. Now, Angola has a unique population in that about 90% of the people who are, um, are there will live there till they die. So there's a whole different motivation where I think people are, um, people are paroled and released um, a lot more from, from at least the prison here, as I understand. Um, there is so much work to do in this area. Um, and there is so, there's so many so many different ways to approach this, but um, but I think the message here is that there is just a lot of work to be done, and we can't give up. So, mm -hmm. Pat, I'm trying to remember uh, there was a special documentary uh, about the healthcare and end of life uh, program at Angola, right? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, but I'm blanking on the name of it. Yeah, it's called um, it's called. It's called Serving Life, um, and yeah. it's I think pretty pretty available widely, yes. Yes. and it is a documentary that, um, in fact, we were there when they were shooting some of it, yeah. um, and it is uh, and I think Oprah Winfrey's channel um, yeah. took it up and all of that. Um, it's a very uh, we found it interesting because it really played up kind of the redemption narrative um, for these hospice volunteers, and we never asked. Um, why people were in prison, <laughs> you know, the volunteers that we interviewed, we never, we didn't care about that. Um, and they put that front and center in this documentary, which was actually, to be honest with you, pretty jarring, um, yes. because we'd actually met many of these people. And, you know, I, I, we didn't really care that 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 wasn't relevant to, I mean, you know, that really wasn't relevant to our research. So, um, uh, but uh, but there's also one that's that is actually was uh, shot in Iowa, um, and you know um, um, there are a handful around. But I think Serving Life is the one that you're talking about. That yes, was, yes, um, yes. Was yes. Yeah, it's very very impactful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to say um, uh, there is someone from the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I saw that, yeah. Yes, yeah. and she's 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 inviting you to um, connect with her because she thinks that um, um, you know she'd be interested in connecting with you all and seeing sort of how um, you can help them and how they can move this discussion forward mm -hmm. um, at the mm -hmm. Minnesota Department of Corrections. So that's an awesome connection to make. Um, uh, here's an important question, whether you have information on that uh, ethnic breakdown, racial and ethnic breakdown of the prison population, um, and uh, 
uh, whether the responders to your survey reflect the population that they're serving, you know, whether there is racial and ethnic concordance there between the people who are doing um, advanced care planning discussions and the folks who are, you know, be engaged, the, um, the people in prisons. And, and whether you see that question is whether you see um, a possible discordance there as a potential barrier. Uh, to the completion of a uh, healthcare directive? It's a great question because these issues around, uh, I mean, that it, it's sort of um, equity issues piled on top of equity issues. And it's important to think about those uh, concerns about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Pat, do you want to tackle that one? <laughs> well, the answer to the question is that dash the majority of our, um, of our of our respondents were white. Um, and frankly, the majority of the prison population is non-white. And so I think there is a real um, issue with that. There's certainly a real issue with power. Uh, there certainly is a real issue with, uh, I mean, I see a question here about, about who makes decisions and how much free choice people really do have. And, uh, and also how much knowledge people who make these decisions have about feudal care and have about, um, have about, um, about progression of chronic illness and, um, and benefits and burdens of treatment. So, so yes, um, yes, indeed, there is a huge misconnect, um, disconnect. I think that um, that certainly, you know, affects this um, as it affects everything. Um, and uh, tr training, training peer volunteers, uh, training peers uh, to, to conduct this work, uh, you know, is probably a really good, good first step here um, is to help, help, you know, um, um, that would be my suggestion, but but there, but there is a real issue about who's in charge and who's 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 li who's living in prison. You know, when I when I first started looking at, at these data when they were coming in, I thought, oh gosh, you know, this is an issue outside of prisons that our healthcare professionals do not necessarily reflect the patients we care for. Yeah, you know, and I can say that being in a nurse for over forty years, you know, it's still a challenge. So, um, but this, this seemed even more uh, intense in terms of that um, differences between who's providing the care and, and that population that they're caring for. Uh, very, very different. So great question and more work is needed. It's the theme of today for sure. Yes. Oh, so uh, one questioner asks um, about what's in um, whether uh, people who are incarcerated have the same rights regarding advanced care planning as the rest of society. And um, I, I think, I mean, that's a, a huge question, obviously. Um, and, you know, to some extent, I would imagine the answer is, well, you know, everyone has a right to do advanced care planning. The, the question is really, um, in reality, are those rights realized, right? But I'm also, if I can just sort of tag on to this question, because there was one, so many things about your talk that I found really interesting, but one of the things I found really striking was the bit of data that said only 11% of your respondents, um, you know, said that the, said that in their facility peers were allowed to be agents, which is really striking because your your choice of who your agent can be is not not limited or not so limited when you complete an advanced care direct or a healthcare directive outside of prison. So I, I wonder if you can talk a bit about sort of the disconnect in rights in prison and, mm -hmm. and outside of prison. I'll just make a couple comments. You know, our participants, 85% reported that they provided persons in prison the opportunity to complete a healthcare directive. 
So the opportunity to complete the directive. So we don't know, you know, when I read that again, I was like, oh, does that mean they really follow through or, or not? Because I thought, well, that's pretty high percent. And, and we, we know that's probably not accurate in terms of how many people actually complete one. So, um, and I too, am just really sad about the fact that there's small percent of our peers because their peers, especially when you consider that many may be estranged from family and friends who, who know them and want to support them and be their healthcare agent. Um, and they've lived for years with their peers and know them and know their wishes and dreams and, and really what they want for end of life. So I, I was, I was kind of shocked when I first saw that 11%, you know, I, like, are we sure? Or are we got to go back over this to make sure these mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, yeah, Pat. We at the very beginning hope to answer this question because I think this is a million dollar question is that how much control do people really have? Um, and I, I am, you know, um, I think about this from both sides. I think about it from um, people saying, you know what, I, I don't want any more chemotherapy. I don't want any more treatment. Um, and then the other side, yes, I do want to go for it. Yes, I do want everything. Um, you know, and that, I, that's a beauty, I think, of a really good advanced uh, care plan and advanced um, and advanced care planning discussion is that people's people's individual preferences get known. And even in my I mean, in my practice, there are people that no matter what um, want to go for it. Um, and um, and we had hoped to tease out those issues. Seems like, um, and you know, this is way beyond our data, but John and I talked a lot about wondering about how much control people really have, especially when they're not able to fully participate and when they don't have anybody to, to actually represent their wishes. Um, much like the people that he that that he and colleagues worked in the home worked with in the homeless population. So so you know when is too much too much? When is futile? When does that um, when does that, um, you know, um, you know, when does that become basically cruel and unusual punishment to use, you know, to use, I, um, I use part of the constitutional language here. We were really interested in that and, and we were hoping to get at that during our focus groups and also focus groups of people, um, you know, people in leadership um, as well. Um, so, but that, but that still is something that really, really, really that, I mean, that question, I think to me is really one of the most important ones. So if you have an advanced directive, what does it do uh, basically? Um, and, um, you know, both sides, uh, um, limiting foregoing treatment as well as wanting everything done. So, cause there's also financial issues here too. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, you know, hospitalization is expensive because oftentimes people have to go with security uh, with, with guards and 24 seven and all of that. It's very expensive. Um, so I, I see that there was a question about, um, that looked just like a question of clarification about what is an ACP facilitator. It's really somebody who facilitates discussions around creating an advanced care plan. Is there, just to clarify, is there is there anything else either of you would say about that in particular, about what that role is? No, I think that pretty much captures it. And I think there may be a, there may be a myth that you have to be a healthcare professional to do that. Um, um, you don't, um, there, there's actually, the Honoring Choices Minnesota people have a very nice way of, of helping people through that discussion. There's another, um, there's another uh, organization that's called the Conversation Project that's totally free that you can, um, you know, on that, e that easily could be adapted um, really to any population. Um, and and um, the Respecting Choices people out of Wisconsin, really the main focus of their training is non-healthcare people. 
um, and and uh, you know basically to um, you know basically to facilitate a discussion as opposed to 25 years ago um, there are so many resources now out there about and but a good place to start I think the honoring choices Minnesota folks are um, are great and uh, they've done a nice job um, as well thanks Pat couple of couple of uh additional questions um and we only have a couple of minutes so we'll quickly um one is about whether hospital admission is a possibility for end-of-life care and i think you've already addressed that to some extent pat in terms mm -hmm. of the sort of barriers to using that or at least the expense of using that um uh there's a, also a question about palliative or comfort care options i don't mm -hmm. know if you want to say more about either of those two things well, I think this is really dependent on the state. Um, I think some prisons don't have the capacity to deal with people. They don't have an infirmary, for example, at all. Um, and that's what we saw with people being transferred to a different, um, different kind of level of care. Um, I know, just speaking from my experience in Louisiana, they would get people um, from other, from, um, from other facilities in the state. Um, I think one of the women's prisons in Louisiana also had an infirmary. Um, and, you know, the purpose really, you know, the, you know, I mean, um, to be transferred for the, hosp the hospital usually, usually uh, is for people requiring hospital level care. And so, um, yeah, and so certainly, Certainly, you can do comfort care and palliative care. Um, I, I don't. Uh, this may sound like heresy, but it's not really hard to control symptoms. Um, really, I mean, you don't. You know, I mean, it's a. You know, to really control most of the symptoms and to understand it. Once again, the issue I think is helping staff uh, learn about that and to normalize the normal signs of, of you know approaching death. Um, yeah. So. Um, my colleague Susan Loeb um, in in actually Pennsylvania is um, is embarking on a on a on a um, um, on a project where she hopes to uh, train volunteers and also um, uh, prison infirmary staff in Pennsylvania. So stay tuned. Thanks, Pat. I'm afraid we're out of time. There were more questions in the Q&A, but we're not, we're not unfortunately gonna be able to get to them all. Um, I am sure our speakers would be happy to hear from you after the event if you'd like to reach out. Um, let me just uh, call your attention to the plan for next month's Ethics Grand Rounds. Um, uh, Dr. Kellen Baker uh, and Dr. Catherine Dahlke uh, will be with us to talk about the recent National Academies report on understanding the health and well-being of sexual and gender diverse populations. Uh, that should be a really fascinating conversation, and, and we hope that you can join us for that as well. Thank you very much um, to Dr. O'Connor Vaughn and, and Dr. Barry for joining us today. Uh, this has been a really rich uh, and interesting and important conversation, and, and I appreciate everyone uh, who participated. Hope to see you all next month. Thank you all.